Nothing can ruin him. There are scores of men that seem brighter than him, but Frank has the directing mind and will move them about like pawns on a board. So wrote Nathaniel Hawthorne, author of the bestseller The Scarlet Letter and friend to the 14th President of the United States, Franklin Pierce. But it's the kind of endorsement. Nothing can ruin him. That makes you cringe a little. Had anyone ever been as thoroughly repudiated as Franklin Pierce? Asked Congressman John Sherman of Ohio. He's about to be defeated by his own party, his own state, and I believe his own town. The Chief Justice of his home state reflected that opinion. In hell, they'll roast him like a herring. A new newspaper, the New York Times, said, the man who enters upon the presidency an inspiring demagogue is quite certain to quit a disappointed, sorry, and resentful one. A toad in amber, a disappointed, ambitious man, worthy of no particular notice. The president is reprehensible. The disgrace was felt nationally, it seemed. In Chicago, former congressman... Abraham Lincoln ridiculed Pierce as a rejected lover, making merry at the wedding of his rival. Pierce had spent so much time dragging the chestnuts of the fire for others to eat that his claws were burnt off to the grizzle, and he's thrown them aside as unfit for future use. Texas's Sam Houston said Pierce had betrayed more pledges and deceived more men than any man that has ever lived. George Templeson Strong, a future New York mayor, said of Pierce's last days of the presidency, In his approaching days of insignificance, he cannot make himself more infamous than he already has. We thank God that President Pierce's term is coming to an end, wrote a paper from his own Democratic Party. Indeed, Franklin Pierce, former senator from New Hampshire, one of the youngest presidents who emerged from nowhere to earn the nomination of his party for president, who defeated a war hero in the election, is known, for one, to be one of the few presidents not to receive a nomination from his party after completing four years of service and not having been a vice president. A few votes in the early ballots of 1856 Democratic Convention but then would fade, and the party would move on to select Pierce's own ambassador to Great Britain. Oh, a few voices he got, grateful delegates of the Southern Democratic Party, and this northerner, Pierce, hailing from New Hampshire, had a great many friends to the South. Jefferson Davis, his friend and Secretary of War, felt that he had been a fair president, a son of a political family in Boston was friendly with Pierce after his presidency and took him into Boston into one of the society places and was shocked. No one wanted to shake the hand or talk to this former president. Pierce's name was Mud in the North. And he earned the moniker of Doughface, a northern politician who did the bidding of the Southern slave power. Many possibilities for the origin of this term, but it seems like it actually comes from a Southern senator who thought that some of the Northerners were just so willing to give their votes up for some kind of favor that they looked doe face, like D-O-E, face of a deer. He said, uh, we could have as many of their votes as we wanted. There are always three more. And that term, doe face, eventually spelled D-O-U-G-H, Doughface, was an attack 
it seemed, on the bravery of a person, sided with slave owners in the South and wouldn't stand up to them. Pierce had so often positioned himself as a Northern politician who, while not pro-slavery himself, had a respect for the Constitution, for the Union, for slavery as a constitutional right, in his opinion. When he was called a doe face on the Senate floor, he insisted on an apology. But the term would be used many more times. You don't know Franklin Pierce. He's probably the, the president about which the least is known. I know I have many listeners who, of course, uh, study the presidents in greater detail, so, so a few of you may. But I'm sure Franklin Pierce is, is one of those that you don't know. And part of the reason is, after the Civil War, I mean, looking back, the retrospective on his presidency was that he was one of the worst. It was so bad that Pierce himself, speaking to a state fair a year after his presidency, was speaking to a group of young people and told them that whatever these young men do, those that have a good homestead surrounded by friends should stay there. It was, after all, not his choice to become president. Or was it? Certainly, uh, he got the nomination only on the 49th ballot in the Democratic Convention in 1852. And certainly, if we're there four years before in 1848, no one would have suggested Franklin Pierce for the presidency. There's one story told many times in that Pierce was riding in a carriage and asked a friend who the Democrats had nominated. It is you, sir, they replied. That cannot be so. His wife, Jane, daughter of the president of Bowdoin College, big family, but also very nervous person, very shy person, and someone who had suffered tragedy in that her first child and her second child had died, was reported to be pale-faced upon hearing the news that her husband would now be president. She hated the politics. He'd just retired from the Senate. Very young. She hated the politics. Yet in terms of Pierce's surprise reaction, this story might be chalked up to legend. Pierce's friend, New Hampshire editor Edmund Burke, no relation to the statesman and, and writer, was at the convention and writes several letters to Pierce. I've looked at these letters where he's informing him of activities before the convention, during the convention, and then upon the moment of the nomination and the canoncade. Burke says, we did everything that he wanted at the convention. We know this much. Uh, Pierce gave his assent to be a favorite son. In other words, he would put his name for president that generally only the people in New Hampshire would support. And then it made the delegates available down the ballots. We can stop supporting our favorite son, Pierce, and go with someone else. That's a very common tactic. He was aware that many Southern delegates liked Pierce. And of all the Northerners, a Virginian congressman told Burke, Pierce was the most acceptable. And as some of the big names, the heavyweights in the Democratic Party at that time, Lewis Cass from Michigan, who was the 1848 nominee, Stephen Douglas from Illinois, powerhouse in politics and in real estate and everything at this time, James Buchanan, the former Secretary of State, which at th this time, if we're talking about 1852, is still like the position that you would, could go to the presidency from. All of them kind of expected that the nomination would be theirs. But no one was willing to give up. So with this triangle of obstruction, the Virginia delegation is meeting at the convention, and they read a letter that Franklin Pierce wrote. And he's defending the fugitive slave law. By the time you get to ballot 49, the southern delegates go for Pierce. The Fugitive Slave Law required states in the North to return slaves who had escaped to their slave owners in the South. Franklin Pierce is always a little hard to capture on, on, on all of these issues. There are a lot of allegations that he was secretly an abolitionist. This is something that the Whigs in the 1852 election are going to attack him on. John Calhoun, while he was living 
you know, Pierce would get up and make these statements that really enlarged the amount of support for Southern slave owning that existed in his state of New Hampshire. He would say things like, there's not one in five uh, people who don't think that uh, owning slaves is a constitutional right that has to be protected. And Calhoun didn't really like this game that he, was, that he felt he was playing and pointed out how a petition from abolitionists, when compared to the population of New Hampshire, showed that there were more votes, definitely one out of five, supporting abolition of slavery in New Hampshire. You got a smorgasbord of politics at the time we're talking about. Northern and Southern Democrats are split up. Northern and Southern Whigs are split up. But there are three main camps, and those would be hardcore abolitionists who want an end to slavery on the federal level, or at the very least, you know, keep it in the South, don't allow it to expand into any territory of the United States. Then you have the Southern ultras, fire eaters, whatever you'd like to call them, that are close to where they're going to be 10 years from now in terms of secession, but not advocating that yet. Jefferson Davis, one of the things he's fond of saying at this time when he's attacked as a secessionist or nullifier, is that uh, he's only, he only thinks of that as a, as a last resort. We have a right to do it, but only as a last resort. It's not something we should go to the minute we don't like a law. You know, so that's his argument. He's a Southern ultra, absolutely. In the middle... You have the Compromise of 1850 that was recently agreed to in Congress, and it was the last masterwork of Henry Clay, who's now dead during this election. And the Compromise of 1850 essentially gives you an idea of the moderates on the various sides. So there's some Southerners that voted for it because they got the fugitive slave law enforcement out of it. And there's some Northerners who voted for it because they got California admitted as a free state. The very west of the country, the Pacific, this new area would be free of slavery. And so that compromise put together by Clay and Stephen Douglas was supported by Franklin Pierce. Pierce's name doesn't even appear at the convention until the 46th ballot. And then it's a steamroller. Happy Democrats say to their Whig opponents, we poked you in 44, we'll pierce you in 1852. Pierce is a Mexican war hero. I mean, there's a dispute. The Whigs make fun of his record. Uh, there's rumors that he drinks, and indeed, uh, he was known to do so. Of course, everybody in the 19th century was always attacking opponents for this. Pierce had been wounded in battle. His horse fell on him, and uh, so a little war, war hero cred, but... Of course, he was running against Winfield Scott, the guy that took Mexico City. So 1852 is one election where the military guy doesn't always won because the superior record was Scott's. He wins a huge electoral victory. And there is this moment because with all the politics split up so much, the Whigs carry only four states. So he's got an electoral map to brag about. And you have this guy in office who has been attacked by Southern ultras, who's been attacked by abolitionists. He, he's kind of seems like right down the middle. And he's making appointments. It's Jefferson Davis going to be a secretary of war. So that's a Southern ultra who didn't support the Compromise of 1850. William Marcy, former governor, New York, very much a moderate, puts him as secretary of state. He's forgiving everyone who had fought the battles in the past, and the Democratic Party is going to be unified, and the country perhaps could be unified. The Whigs have been destroyed in the election. It's up to the Democrats now to lead. He was, future Vice President Hannibal Hamlin said, the personification of young America. Dark auburn hair, blue eyes, a square jaw, strikingly handsome, a slender muscular physique, gregarious and social. A soft and pleasing voice, attuned to melody itself. An engaging manner that readily captivates the beholder. No man dresses more appropriately on all occasions. He read the classics, sent friends fine wines selected by his own hand. He'd go on to put hot water heating in the White House for the first time. 
add decorative ceilings in the White House and have the most lively parties for the diplomatic representatives of foreign nation. For the first time, a diplomat says, we have our equal in President Pierce. When he's meeting with these dignitaries, he outshines them. And how about his ride? He rode in a carriage with plate glass windows, Morocco lining, driven by white horses with gleaming silver. He was the young Hickory, comparing him favorably to Andrew Jackson, the young Hickory of the Granite State. And for anyone who thinks, like, in the 19th century, you didn't have television sets, would you need to really have a youthful image? Well, maybe it's not as essential as in the the age of Kennedy, but Franklin Pierce had it. He was impressive. He was 48, youngest president up to that time to take the office. Authors, editors, speakers are talking about this concept of young America in 1850. Like, there's so much we can expand now. The country, you know, the country is so young. We're growing in population. We got a state on the Pacific Ocean. And he says something in his inauguration speech, in addition to, again, supporting the fugitive slave law. He says, we're not going to be timid about expansion. We're not going to listen to voices who say that it's a bad idea. And by expansion, he's looking at new nations, Cuba. He's looking at the West. Early in his presidency in 1853, a hopeful moment, the New York Crystal Palace constructed from iron and glass, the shape of a Greek cross crowned by a dome 100 feet in diameter. Iron construction just coming into its own in the 1850s. To reach the second story, visitors would have to climb one of 12 broad staircases in this glass building. Staircases, the railings, were painted a rich cream color, accented in red, blue, and yellow. Here's what Walt Whitman says about the Crystal Palace in 1853. A palace, lofter, fairer, ampler than any yet, Earth's modern wonder, history seven outstripping, gladdening the sun and sky in hued, in the cheerfulest hues, bronze, lilac, robin's egg, marine and crimson, over whose golden roof shall flaunt beneath thy banner, freedom. This was the opening of the World's Fair, And all the countries in the world sent representatives to New York City to see this Crystal Palace and hear Franklin Pierce deliver the opening, a fair that would demonstrate new inventions, cameras, lung capacity monitors, advanced clocks, improved printing presses. Commodore Perry, who was assigned to a mission to open up trade in Japan by President Millard Fillmore, has now returned with a treaty secured. Peace with all nations, tranquility, relative tranquility at home, even as great issues are being decided. The Whigs had failed. Now it's time for the Democrats to take over. He sends his U.S. minister to Mexico to negotiate a purchase for $15 million. We purchase 30,000 square miles of territory, which will become Arizona and New Mexico, bottom part. Pierce proposes a bold plan in his 1853 address. you got to remember, the U.S. looks odd right now. You have California as a state on the end, and you have the East Coast, where most of the population is. You have the South, and you've got a lot of empty land in between that's very difficult to traverse. And if you're going from California to Washington, D.C., you're probably going on a boat. Stagecoach, very dangerous, takes a long time, just difficult land to traverse. So he proposes a railroad. Now, This is important because previously he had been one of the Jacksonians in Congress against internal improvements. But he says this, Within this limit, and to the extent of the interest for the government involved, it would seem both expedient and proper if an economical and practical route shall be found to aid by all constitutional means in the construction of a road, which will we reunite by speedy transit the populations of the Pacific and Atlantic states. It's not man on the moon. But for 1853, it's spicy. But wait, 
This is still Franklin Pierce, the Jacksonian, against Whiggish, Henry Clay-like federal spending on infrastructure. So he says this. The general government, the federal government, is not embarrassed by the question of jurisdiction. It is, even with the limits of a territory, a doubtful power for the government to administer, to administer the affairs of a railroad. So he's conservative about this. I wish the Atlantic and Pacific shores of our public should be bound together by ties of common interest. I shall be disposed to follow the lights of the Constitution. Okay, so we want to build a railroad, but no rush. Here's what he says. We can afford to wait, but we cannot afford to overlook the arc of our security. He's talking about the Constitution. Okay, then, uh, not so much of a moonshot anymore. More of like, I'd really like to send a man on the moon. I'd like to build a railroad, but we may have to wait for the states or territories to administer it. Nonetheless, as cautious as Pierce is, this proponent and symbol of young America is giddy at the prospect of a booming population, which we must remember is so obviously fueled by unburdened immigration. Note this again in the 1853 State of the Union Address. The census since the start of the Constitution has doubled every 25 years, he says. Talks about life expectancy, birth rates, but to the influence of these causes may be added the influx of laboring masses from Eastern Asia to the Pacific side of our possessions, together with the probable ascension of populations already existing in other parts of our hemisphere, who, he says, will feel the attraction of a powerful and prosperous confederation of self-governing republics. Yeah, catch his language there. Pierce is on the state's right side of things when it comes to whether states are Sovereign, a confederation of republics, as he sees it. So, side note there. We will gain virgin soil, he says, from acquired land, and they are destined to swarm with the fast-growing and fast-spreading millions of our race. Okay, so this is important because you often think of the stodgy old black-and-white photo or watercolor illustrations of presidents in the 19th century, you know, and think like, oh... They're going to be very conservative on these issues, and on many, Pierce is, but here he's positively futuristic, and it's a very modern country and a very young president. He wants new states, and he wants Americans moving to them, and he wants people from all over to move into America. He's using his presidential state of the union, his first one, to celebrate working laborers moving in. Within 50 years, he says, the population will be at 100 million. Now, President Pierce is wrong. He'll turn out to be wrong. He's not the only president to get this wrong. Uh, this is, shows you what they thought in the, in the 1850s. You're not going to get to 100 million until the 1920s. So his prediction's just a little off. It's off by about 20 years because growth does slow down a bit. But you see how fast America's growing, and it leads to this odd combination of a pro-states, rights, limited government, southern-supporting, yet pro-immigration president. He's bragging. Peace with nations. Repose on the bitter domestic issues. And with the Compromise of 1850 and a fine surplus in the Treasury, a booming population, Franklin Pierce's presidency. What could possibly go... In the choice, though, between repose and peace and the stated goal of expanding young America... Pierce proved to be not moderate or neutral. And the choice between Southern rights, those who felt the Constitution absolutely prevented the federal government from doing anything about slavery. Pierce was consistent. He wasn't balancing. He could be on the same side as Jefferson Davis on these issues. One of the things that's going to happen, and this is kind of a... I don't, I don't believe in hexes and, and Paul, so sometimes when the story's told, it's like, oh, his presidency was a disaster because of this omen or whatever. But one thing that's going to happen is he's going to lose his son in a horrific train accident that occurs right before he becomes president. Sends his wife into, this is their, their third and final child. They all have died. His wife, Jane, is going to move to the upper floor of the White House and put black drapings on the windows. She very much thinks that God is punishing Franklin for engaging in this lowly profession of politics, drinking, and seeking power. 
Now, again, I don't like the whole idea of a Paul or an Omen or anything like that. Certainly, if you were making a movie about Franklin Pierce, and I'm not sure that's going to happen anytime soon. Might, might be an interesting one, though. That might be the first scene. But what it does have, the practical effect of this, is that Pierce is a little bit, in the beginning of his presidency, some of the, some of the thunder's taken right out of him. And it's seen that some of the stronger people in his cabinet, Jefferson Davis, probably the, the leader of the pack, are going to assume more power within his administration. So as we mentioned, he secures land from the government of Mexico, Santa Ana, again president after the defeat in the Mexican War, needs money. Uh, now they're supporting Congress for a railroad that would connect the South to the Pacific, but there's something else they want. And this echoes throughout U.S. history. They want Cuba. They want new territory. They want new crops. They want to avoid a revolution such as happened in Haiti, where the black population, the slaves, overthrew the French and started their own republic. They think this might happen in Cuba. And I think a good deal of the Southerners want nine new congressmen and two new senators who would probably be very loyal to the South. Well, Spain owns Cuba at this time, and one of the things that's going to occur is that they seize an American ship, Black Warrior, and they're a house for war. But Spain returns the ship, and to avoid any kind of action, they, Spain sends more soldiers to the garrison in Havana. Pierce, although he supports a more American-friendly government in Cuba. He would support expanding into Cuba. Can't support a war with Spain. Next, there are two sets of filibusters, or pirates, that are operating in Nicaragua. And with 55 men, a fellow named Walker, who had already caused trouble trying to start a republic in the southern part of California, tries to create a republic in Nicaragua, and he does overthrow the government there using some ragtag army of some Nicaraguans who aren't satisfied with the government. Secretary of State Marcy orders diplomats not to recognize the new Nicaraguan government and not to deal with Walker. But Pierce's diplomat in Nicaragua is a supporter of the Walker government, and he deals with them ignores Marcy's order. Pierce, again, though, is not ready to start a war, and so when Costa Rica and Honduras, offended by the new government in Nicaragua and having some backing from an American businessman, Cornelius Vanderbilt, they attack the government in Nicaragua and overthrow it. So stymied by taking land by force, he attempts to take the land by purchase. Diplomats, his minister to France, Sole, his minister to England, James Buchanan, and his minister to Spain, John Mason, confer at a meeting in Brussels. And they have a memo that they record of this meeting in which they're talking about acquiring Cuba. It's a memo and a meeting that Franklin Pierce will come to wish never happened. But one of the emotional events that turns against the Pierce administration is that a fugitive slave, Anthony Burns, is in Boston. He has run away from his owner in the South. Boston is known among all the cities to be the most protective of runaway slaves. There's all kinds of support there. Burns is captured, though, by federal marshals. And they're attempting to return him to his owner to enforce the fugitive slave law. Pierce is a doughface, so he wants enforcement of the law. Crowd of hundreds of abolitionists rescue Burns. In the process, they killed a federal deputy. Pierce orders Jefferson Davis to send the Marines into Boston. And despite a huge protest, 50,000 people lining the streets of Boston in support of this fugitive slave, Anthony Burns shouting, kidnapper, shame, shame, black drapes on all the windows in Boston, church bells ringing, not in celebration, but for action, weeping, Bostonians watching as Burns is brought out and brought to the dock and picked up 
on a federal revenue cutter. And from the streets of Boston, free, free Boston, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, with huge support for the cause of abolition, taken from the city and returned to his owner. Amos Lawrence said that he went to sleep a moderate and woke up a raving mad abolitionist because of the Burns event. The real blow to the administration would come when Senator Douglas, with support from Davis, David Rice Atchison, who is the a senator from Missouri, pro-slavery, introduced a bill to create two new states, Nebraska and Kansas, out of this Nebraska territory that's sitting there next to Missouri. Now, on the surface, it's a perfect compromise. After all, Kansas would be next to Missouri, and that would likely become a slave state. It would be populated from Missouri, or so they think. And Nebraska is close to Iowa. Iowa is a free state, and it would probably easily be settled. But Douglas's bill, although he's clever about how he words it, does something else. It, in effect, repeals the Missouri Compromise that said that slavery was not to be had in the United States in any northern territories. What Kansas-Nebraska does is erase that compromise. The great Henry Clay, who had just died, he had worked so hard to preserve this, to preserve union. This is a key component of the Compromise of 1850 that Franklin Pierce earned his political credibility on. And now his administration, he's very much involved. His own newspaper, the Washington Union, then and now, you know, presidents had their form of media. And the Washington Union is where you found out what a Democratic president was thinking, what they were supporting, what they're doing. He very much supports Kansas, Nebraska, and in fact tells Democrats that no more Mr. Nice Guy, if you don't support this, there's going to be patronage on the line. If you want anything from this White House, you're going to support Franklin Pierce, you're going to support Senator Douglas's bill. Something else is going on here. So many Whig and moderate Democrats have been targeted by Southern ultras. Uh, anyone who went ahead and voted for that Compromise of 1850, Davis and some of the other, Atchison and some of the other senators, are targeting them. And so Harold Cobb of Georgia, Jeremiah Clements of Alabama, Henry Foote in Mississippi, all supporters of the Compromise of 1850 that apparently the president was for, is now, with some help from at least his cabinet, they're defeated in their elections and replaced by Southern Ultras. So Kansas, Nebraska has no problem passing. It's law of the land. The revision, though, and the repeal of a measure that great figures like Clay and Webster had supported, I mean, Jefferson's, you know, what was, was shocking. It's definitely one of these beltway, before there was a beltway type issues. Like in Washington, it seemed, yeah, Kansas, Nebraska would just work everything out. Under the Kansas, Nebraska Act, it's up to the territory to conduct a vote, and they'll determine whether they're a free state or slave state. But it's shocking. Jefferson's secretary, Edward Cole, yes, this is the man who we talked about a, a while ago, who put together Jefferson and Adams speaking together, or writing letters again together after so many years. He speaks out against this breach that Kansas, Nebraska is of a great compromise that was holding the union together. A railroad lawyer little thought of, kind of forced out of politics for being against the Mexican War, gets back into politics in Illinois, speaking at numerous demonstrations. He follows Douglas at speeches, arguing for the other side where he's listened to. But Senator Douglas pays little attention to this Whig rabble-rouser Lincoln. Then that calamity of all presidents occurred. The 1854 congressional elections this is after the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Anti-Nebraska forces, Whigs, know-nothing, anti-immigrants, also opposed to slavery, also opposed to expansion of the country, opposed to the Democrats. Some independent Democrats who leave the party, Northern Democrats, and a new party starts in Wisconsin, the Republican Party. But there's other names too, Union, People's Party, Fusion Party, whatever the name, and even if they didn't have a coherent national message yet, these combined anti-Nebraska forces deliver the largest midterm defeat of any president up until that time. 
and it changes control in the House. Now, they're going to have a hard time electing a speaker in this election because they're, the opponents of the administration are so divided. But one thing they're not divided about is their opposition to the Pierce administration. Pierce goes from having 150 loyal Democrats that he could count on to about 70. And the Democratic Party loses control of the House. Said Henry Foote, Southern Whig, in less than a 12 month after Mr. Pierce's induction to the presidency, every man of solid understanding, both in Congress and elsewhere, became satisfied of his utter incompetency. He no longer controls the House. He loses the investigative arm of the national government. And House members, in an investigation, look into what the administration's doing to try to get Cuba. It was a very unpopular idea in the North to have a new slave state appear, and to perhaps start a war with Spain. They require the release of those, the memo that those three diplomats, Sule, Buchanan, and Mason, recorded in Ostend, Belgium. And when it's revealed, it essentially, this memo argues that we must take Cuba. It is basically American property. We must save the hemisphere from what might happen if there's a revolt there. Uh, It's all kinds of reasons why the U.S. is, in effect, deserves Cuba. And in this document, the three diplomats indicate if Spain won't sell it, it has to be taken by force. Secretary of State William Marcy didn't approve this memo, but they're operating without his authority. Congress forces the release of this memo. Northern newspapers light up. Uh, there's a funny cartoon where James Buchanan is, is surrounded by a bunch of hoodlums who are going to rob them. And like, you know, Buchanan has this really nice top hat and really nice suit and everybody else you can see is a little disheveled, like their top hats are all crinkled and they're about to rob him, but they're citing all the reasons that are in the Austin memo. Well, we have to rob you in order to save you. You know, uh, we have to rob you because we deserve what's in your pocket. And that's the kind of opinion that you're seeing in the North over this, um, this scandal. But what it really does is inflame the, the, the opinions of the British, the French, and the Spanish, who don't want to deal with the Pierce administration at all in terms of trying to purchase Cuba. One of the things that's really hurting Pierce at this time is that after a few mistakes— And you see this with presidencies. After a few initial mistakes, everybody starts to back off a bit, even though he's got really good support from Jefferson Davis, who is going to still be his friend after his presidency and and all of that. And even though he does the bidding in terms of enforcing the fugitive slave law and in terms of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, he does the bidding of Southerners with his presidential pen. It's not going to stop a group of Southern ultras from starting their own newspaper. Um, we mentioned like Franklin Pierce's uh, Democratic organ was the Washington Union. And that's where if you read something there, you know, it was coming from Marcy or Davis or Pierce or or Caleb Cushing, the attorney general. Um, Southerners start the Washington Sentinel. And this is a really pro-slavery paper. And even though Southerners are kind of chummy with Pierce, it doesn't stop this paper from vilifying Pierce as incompetent. And as a secret abolitionist, they keep printing rumors. Yes, hashtag fake news, 19th century, right? So all of this is an encumbrance to him leading. The head of his patent office said that Pierce's executive mansion was cheerless. I've seen log cabins with more happiness. Rumors abounded. He was hitting the brandy. He's taken to the cups said an unfriendly Boston minister. Residents of Washington, D.C. would notice that under the cover of darkness, he would ride alone in town on his horse, named Union. It would get worse. Political problems transformed into a crisis of the Republic in 1855 and 1856. One of the side effects of Kansas-Nebraska Act is that it sounds democratic. Just have an election in the territory of the people who live there to decide whether to allow slavery or not. You know, it's very similar to arguments that you hear today, like, don't let Washington decide. Don't let somebody in Massachusetts decide what's going on in Kansas. Let the people who live there. Sounds logical, right? Don't let the big 
national abolition movement or the big national slaveholding power to either of them to affect this choice. Don't get involved in local squabbles. But it turned out to be not so simple. Because if the territory, like Kansas, it had few American settlers. This is where Indians that were forcibly removed from New York and Pennsylvania and other places were moved to this Nebraska territory. There's only about a thousand white settlers in the entire territory, which is more than just Kansas and Nebraska today. It's an area that goes all the way into parts of Colorado and Wyoming. Very few white settlers there. The problem is what you're setting up is a race to see who will move there. And that meant that these new territories would be involved in the same squabbles as we're going on nationally. Free soilers, believers in abolition, figure that while they don't like the Kansas-Nebraska Act, they can still win. Because the North has one thing, it's population, and they can win the territorial vote if they move people there. They have the numbers, they have more money than the pro-slavery Southerners can. They can win this race. And they form emigrant aid societies, particularly in Massachusetts, that actually assist, provide funding to move spirited Yankee settlers to Kansas. There's an amazingly quick emigration. It's so fast that it almost catches the Southerners off guard because they're figuring with Missouri, a slave state, right next door, they can easily move people to Kansas. But the next year after the act is passed, there are 1,200 settlers from the north in Kansas sent with their Yankee abolitionist beliefs, with their Bibles, in some case, Sharps rifles, called Beecher's Bibles. They formed the towns of Topeka, Manhattan, and Lawrence, named after the now abolitionist merchant and wealthy person Amos Lawrence that we talked about earlier. There are pro-slavery settlements in Kansas, most of them originally Missourians. It's clear the Yankees are taking over. And there are two territorial elections, one in 1854 and one in 1855. In both cases, there's widespread fraud, mostly from the pro-slavery side, border ruffians, as they are called, cross the border by either foot, a horse, or a ferry, come into Kansas with really no intention of living there. They never got the um, settlers from Missouri immediately that they thought they would and vote in these elections. I mean, in one election, there's 1,700 fraudulent votes and 11,000 real votes. They are able to place a majority of pro-slavery territorial commissioners and to have the capital at the pro-slavery settlement of Lecompton, Kansas, instead of the more populated free state areas. Pierce sends over a governor named Andrew Reeder. It's a poor appointment, and he does it to reward the patronage of Reeder. He's a, he's a Democratic bigwig, a lawyer in, in Pennsylvania. Reader sees the obvious fraud in the elections, but he's threatened at gunpoint. And he, to save himself, makes only minimal changes and essentially keeps most of the elections intact. With Free State Kansans complaining, a committee of Congress, now remember, Pierce no longer controls this body, is sent and finds widespread fraud. Pierce ignores the Congressional Commission. And when frustrated free staters form their own government in Topeka, he declares them an insurrection and sends 500 soldiers from nearby forts to quell the rebellion and dismiss the free state legislature. So much for a repose. It gets worse. There is violence in Kansas, and the town of Lawrence is ransacked by an army of pro-slavery Missourians. Fighting erupts, there's killings on both sides. In 1855, John Brown moves to Kansas from Springfield, Massachusetts. He's a strong abolitionist, religious firebrand. He goes to the pro-slavery settlements and singles out men who had threatened free state settlers, who had been known to say things about wiping out the Yankees, and he and his sons hack them to death. Other well, pro-slavery Kansans retaliate. They chase him all over the state. They kill one of his sons. Pierce's take on things is for peace, but for a peace that really favors the South. Uh, here's his State of the Union message from 1856. The minds of so many otherwise good citizens have been so inflamed into the passionate condemnation of domestic institutions of the southern states as a length to passionate hostility against citizens of those states. Extremes beget extremes, so says Franklin Pierce. 
violent attack from the North finds its inevitable consequence, he says in his State of Union, in the growth of a spirit of angry defiance in the South. Pierce does appoint a new governor, Geary, who stops the war in Kansas, but the damage is done. Bleeding Kansas of 55 and 56, coming right at the year of Pierce's hope for renomination and re-election, just looks terrible. One of the things that's going to get Buchanan elected in 1856 is that he was just nowhere near it. I think with any historical figure, there's a temptation to put words in their mouth. Or you just take the common view of textbook or high school history, which is okay given time frames and the scope of coverage, but not always acceptable for those who want to use and maybe apply history to the politics of today because it's too quick. You might just see in a book, Franklin Pierce, Doughface. But let's try to get to the root of his principles, too. Um, we talked a bit about this 1853 State of the Union. Well, since it's a document written in his hand, let's look at that and the 1856 one. This is after he doesn't get the nomination, but yet Pierce's party, with Buchanan on the ticket, wins the presidency. He may be jealous, he may feel bad about it, but he doesn't show it in the address. He celebrates the victory of his ambassador Buchanan to office as if it were his own re-election. The verdict of the people, he believes, is as close to a verdict on his principles as we'll get. It is impossible, Pierce notes, in his 1856 State of the Union, to misapprehend the great principles by which their recent political action, the people of the United States, have sanctioned the constitutional equality of each and all of the states of the Union of States. Okay, we understand that now. He's a doe-face, and the election of Democrats means that Southern rights will be protected from Yankee extremists. They have affirmed the constitutional equality of each and all citizens of the United States as citizens. And note this, Franklin Pierce says, whatever their religion. Ah. Now we see a counter to attacks on Catholicism. It is Pierce bashing know-nothingism and nativism wherever their birth or their residence, they have maintained the inviolability of the constitutional rights of different sections of the Union. They have at the same time disagreed with, he says, marshalling geographic parties attacking each other in a hostile array north or south or east or west. Schemes of this nature, Pierce says, fraught with incalculable mischief and with the considerable sense of the people they have rejected. So, I think it's important to establish where Pierce stands here. He's a unionist. He is a unionist. Even if he knows who to blame and thinks it's the North, his own home area, that started the trouble, he's a unionist. And you will find in these presidential words no support for either extreme abolition or the Confederacy that's about to come. Union is his goal. This from his 1853 address, and keep in mind, he's a descendant of a Revolutionary War soldier of some acclaim, his grandfather. The wisdom of men who know what independence cost, who had put all the stake upon the issue of the revolutionary struggle, disposed of the subject to which I refer in the only way that was consistent with the union of these states and with the march of power and prosperity. From the adoption of the Constitution to the time that the officers and soldiers have passed to their graves. Not all revolutionary soldiers are dead during the Pierce presidency, but a good number are. There was not merely an acquiescence, but a conscious belief in the constitutional right of states. Okay, so we know where he stands here. To jump to the time of the Civil War, he is a unionist, if a Southern sympathetic one, and a friend of Jefferson Davis. Pierce looked on as a former president as several southern states began plans to succeed. He was asked by a leading jurist in Alabama to come to Alabama and address that state's secession convention. He was going to speak against secession and pro-union, try to get them to stop. Due to illness, he had to decline. But he sent a letter appealing to the people of Alabama to remain in the union and give the North time to repeal laws against southern interests and find some common ground before seceding. Within this uh, story of this disastrous uh, president, however charming he may have been, 
you, know, you do see two points here that I think moderns would probably like, generally, most of them. Um, he's a unionist. He's not a president that's going to be a great one to use in, in, in some of the neo-Confederate arguments you see on the internet these days. He spent his entire political career trying to keep the union together. And also, he thinks whether people moved here or whether they were born here, they're citizens, whether they're laboring people, they're citizens, whatever country they came from, whatever religion they have, they're citizens. And so he is a counter in 1852 to that growing know-nothing movement that's happening at the same time first in a society in New York and then spreading across the country into a more of a formal American party, sometimes Native American party, and they're not talking about Indians. He's a counter to that. The Democratic Party at this time is going to be a counter to that. They are supporters of not just immigration, but large scale. The country's young, population's low, a lot of land. So you can look at both sides of that. There are reasons why he's a supporter of immigration. Some of them are political. I mean, it's going to help the Democrats in New York to have more votes, and they're certainly considering that. So generally, the Democratic Party, since the Jacksonian time, are, are supporters of immigration. It's also a large country, and it needs to be populated, and you need workers. Realizing that it's not a one-to-one -one comparison, I still, though, think that uh, barriers to immigration is not something Franklin Pierce was a fan of. This is a sad story of politics, and I suppose of promise and political support quickly evaporating after an election. And yes, you know, it's easy to say, hey, it demonstrates how in the time of fractured politics, that they definitely were in the 1850s, and we're getting a little fractured in 2017, the idea that a magic person will come to the stage, assume the presidency, and give everybody a, you know, a little bit of power, give Davis one office and give Marcy another and mix the, you know, get all the sides and, and get them to work together. Could be a foolish notion. Politics is a process and people don't give up their positions on issues lightly just to support a president. An early presidency can trade on its hopes that it will be different, Right. Prior to a president acting, there's still that mystery. Well, maybe they won't do this, they won't do that, so I'm not going to get upset yet. As each year of a presidency moves forward, it's obvious that you start to make decisions at the White House and you anger one side and maybe gain a few supporters, usually more of the former. In Pierce's case, no one thought he'd be in favor of repealing the Missouri Compromise. So his action on that revealed his problems. This kind of stuff is not different across the time span, and the manifestation of it is in that continued first-term, midterm trend, where usually a president loses seat from their party in the first midterm. Pierce's is the worst up until that time, but many other presidents are going to see the same fate. Buchanan will, Lincoln will, Hayes will, Arthur will, Cleveland will, Harrison will, all going to suffer first-term midterms. What the story of Franklin Pierce can't be is an exact one-to-one -one comparison of today's politics, of course. Interesting story that it is. Pierce won in a landslide. He was exceptionally popular when he first came in. And the divisions weren't just a little bit of politics or cultural, you know, a few preferences different. They were great national questions that in Kansas, it was proved people could very much go to war for. This was a time of violence in Congress. Discussing slavery in public could get you a challenge to a duel. So he's a, his was a disaster in the nation that is hard to compare one on one. But certainly it is a story of a presidency that had great promise and then fell. For just a general knowledge of history, I think it's useful to study Franklin Pierce. This is where you're going to get to how the Civil War happened. A lot of bad and contributory things happened during his term. And he's also an example of a Northerner, a Democrat, who tried to, by appeasing the Southern part of the country and protecting their rights and doing a lot of what they wanted to do, try to keep the Union together and... Buchanan's going to be from the same place. He's Pennsylvanian, who's also doe-faced, 
try the same thing and fail. So the failure of these two Northerners kind of eliminated that play from the playbook. And the next thing that was going to happen was there was going to be a regional party, a Northern party, the Republican party that was going to take the White House. His failure is part of the story. Buchanan's failure is part of the story too. A better president here, a more successful president, might have averted something. Uh, For instance, um, Zachary Taylor, he didn't even want the vote on the Compromise of 1850. He didn't want the Fugitive Slave Act. He wanted California admitted as a free state, and that's it. No compromise. He told South Carolinians if they were going to succeed, he'd send the troops down there. When a group of Southerners in a, in a filibustering mission tried to take over Cuba and, and cause a revolt there, he had the boat arrested. So it is an open question. Zachary Taylor dies in 1850. Millard Fillmore takes office. And so you have three very ineffective presidents, Fillmore, Pierce, and Buchanan, And I think it's an open question whether executive presidential competence is part of the reason for the Civil War. So that's why I think that the Franklin Pierce story is important. And plus, you don't know about them, and now you do. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. Link there to the premium site. One of the things I'm going to do on the premium podcast is talk a bit about how I made this cast and talk generally about my process. So sign up for that can be as little as $2 a month. A note, uh, I'm on Twitter, at M-Y-H-I-S-T. I'm also now on Instagram. So just simply, my history can beat up your politics on Instagram. So I think I could post, you know, some uh, interesting photos there. Thanks for listening.